enthusiastic, nationalistic minded uh, intellectuals. Um, and they had a particular sense of the past, a uh, particular sense of what China's territory was and so forth. And they basically went looking for evidence uh, to augment that vision of the past. The more I looked at this um, issue, the more I realized that this sense of history um, was based upon a past that was rooted in an idea of a permanent but recently humiliated nation. And this provided a lot of the intellectual and political background uh, to what was going on in the South China Sea. And the more I thought about this, the more I, I looked into it, the more I saw parallels with other contemporary issues with questions about Taiwan or Hong Kong or Tibet or Xinjiang. Um, I see the modern day actions of the, the People's Republic of China underpinned by a sense of the past that's rooted as much in nationalist dreaming as in historical evidence. Uh, and I think the reason why I've written the book is because I think this view of the past helps to generate a sense of justification, perhaps even self-righteousness, um, and understanding where this view comes from helps us to explain why the PRC behaves in certain ways and why criticism of its actions so often elicits expressions of anger or humiliation. Um, so we think we need to go back to the period in which this view of history, this view of the nation was actually forged. So um, here is, I'll, I'm gonna disappear for a while and show you some slides. So here's the um, first one, here's the uh, draft cover of the book. Um, and I wrote the book to try to explain how the attitudes and behavior of the modern People's Republic of China have their roots in the period when China started to think of itself as China. Um, the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and part of this project, I suppose, naturally means stressing the continuities between that period and today, the continuities between uh, the pre-revolutionary period, uh, between the Republic and now the People's Republic. And I would characterize this view as founded in the belief that there has always been a Chinese nation, that it is ancient, and that it is and always was homogenous, and that it exists on a piece of territory that matches the current boundaries of the People's Republic uh, and even perhaps beyond those boundaries for some people. Now the argument that I make in the book is that this view of the past was constructed, or I use the word invented, in the dying days of the Qing state and the early Republic by a relatively small group of people and then propagated more widely by the deliberate efforts of reformists and revolutionaries and then state builders. Now the book uh, looks at a whole range of issues. I mean, there's, a, there's the chapter list there covering um, the race, nation, history, language, territory, and so forth. Um, I've chosen the word invention, partly because a book on the word, a book about the construction of China runs the risk of being filed under civil engineering. But I look at what I suppose academics would call the construction of ideas about race and nation and so on. Um, but it's really about the invention of the modern idea of China, the China that we believe we know today. Um, and I should say that from the outset that this view of the constructed nature of Chinese history is derived from reading the work of a lot of other people. So if you're familiar with the work of those scholars who've been labeled the new Qing history school or others who wrote a volume called Critical Hand Studies, then you'll recognize a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. And these scholars include people like Pamela Carl Crossley, James Leibold, Mark Elliott, Julia Schneider, Arif Derlich, and many others. Um, if you're not familiar with the work of the, the new Qing historians, I think I'd summarize their contribution as emphasizing the, the Manchu character of the Qing state. So that was a state which emerged in what's now called Manchuria, northeastern part of China these days, in the early 17th century, which invaded and occupied the previous Ming state to the south, and then expanded into the Mongol lands and Tibet and Xinjiang. And it was a state that practiced what Pamela Crossley has called simultaneous rule. So the emperor would represent himself as a Mongol leader or as a Tibetan leader or as a Sinitic leader, uh, depending on the audience. However, the imperial court itself strived to maintain a Manchu identity. And an excellent example of this 
would be a building in the Forbidden City in Beijing known as the Palace of Earthly Tranquility, which is the picture on the screen at the moment. These days, the building is presented to visitors as the Emperor's Honeymoon Suite. However, in his book on the Forbidden City, uh, Jeremy Barme describes the palace's more common function. And this is where the Manchu um, uh, purpose or the character of the, of the court really comes uh, to the fore. He describes a ceremony every morning after shamanic worship when the imperial household would gather in the central hall of the Palace of Earthly Tranquility while a pig was sacrificed and its meat partially cooked. And then the greasy semi-raw flesh was passed around the assembled members of the Manchu nobility who competed with one another to receive the best cuts. The palace became filthy, its floor spattered with animal fat and its rafters infused with the odours of boiled pork. But this didn't apparently matter to the royal family. It was an intimate, sacred Manchu place close to outsiders. It was also used as the emperor's honeymoon suite on occasions, presumably after it had been cleaned up. So it's just one example of how the, the Manchu nature of the court continued um, uh, despite uh, appearing in other forms uh, to other audiences. And Manchu itself remained the official language of the Qing state right up until its collapse in 1912. Uh, this example uh, I found in the excellent Shanghai History Museum. It's uh, described as the imperial mandate to the parents of Lu Xixiong, who was the chief editor of the Qing State Encyclopedia. One end is written in Chinese characters, but the other is written in Manchu script. There was always a Manchu track within the court secretariat, the Hanlin Academy. All government documents had to be written in the language and all memorials to the emperor presented in it. There were separate archives for documents in Manchu and for the other languages. So even after most Manchus had stopped speaking Manchu in their daily life, hundreds of scholar officials were still busy translating official edicts and reports uh, into Manchu and the other languages. And the emperor continued to address officials and envoys in Manchu and even discipline some who weren't able to speak it properly. Now, another set of arguments that I've drawn upon uh, is derived from the work of writers who've critiqued the idea of an ancient and unchanging Han race. Several of them contributed to this book, uh, Critical Han Studies, published in 2012. Um, I have a chapter in the book on the invention of the idea of the Han race, which I'm not really going to go into today, but to cut a long story short, uh, no one even spoke of a Han race before 1901. Uh, my own research contribution to the book is limited to the South China Sea, but the rest of the work is, the rest of my book is really a work of synthesis, pulling together the efforts of all the people that I've just mentioned, plus plenty of others, and trying to make their stories, the stories of the people they describe, more accessible and connecting them to present day issues. So how can I demonstrate my argument? Um, well, perhaps the easiest way, and that's what I'm going to talk about mostly today, is to look at the, the name of the country. It's the way I also begin the book. Um, as you all know, no state has ever called itself China. There's a discussion to be had about whether the English language name for the country derives from the state of Qin in the third century BC, and there's evidence both for and against. But no state since that time has felt the need to call itself anything to do with either Qin or China. The name disappeared from East Asia and went on a long journey to Europe and then back again. Now, the modern name for the country in Chinese is either Zhongguo, the casual form or the more formal uh, Zhonghua. Uh, but as I will show you, these, the use of these names for the state is a distinctly modern idea. Um, if you go back to the late 19th century, you find one of the first Qing diplomats to visit Europe complaining about the names that foreigners use. One of them was this figure, Zhang Di. Uh, he was a young student who was taught in the Maritime Customs Schools Language College, uh, part of the uh, sort, of, sort of hybrid institution, the Tongwenguan. Now, in May 1871, on a visit to France as a 24-year-old, he wrote in his diary, this is a quote from that diary, after decades of East-West diplomatic and commercial interactions, foreigners know very well that my country is called Da Qingguo, the Qing Great State, or the Zhonghua, but they insist on calling it China, 
The Zhonghua has not been called by such a name over 4,000 years of history. I don't know on what basis Westerners call it by these names. You'll notice that I'm translating Da Qing Wu as Qing Great State, not as Great Qing State. And here I'm following, um, this is a, that's the quote from, from Zhang there. Um, and here I'm following um, uh, Tim Brook uh, in his recent book, uh, Great State. Uh, he argues that there is a meaning hidden within the term Da Guo, uh, Great State, which foreigners have missed. It can be translated as empire, um, but perhaps even that misses the essence of what is essentially an inner Asian form of rule. Brooke argues that the term was invented by the Mongols and then transferred to subsequent great states from the Ming onwards. Uh, but what's important to note here is that even in the late 19th century, the state didn't formally call itself either Zhongguo or Zhonghua. So why is it called that now? It's a more intricate story than you might imagine. Now, you may know that the term Zhongguo has been around for a very long time. It's been found inscribed in oracle bones dating back to perhaps 1600 BCE, uh, but its, meeting, its meaning has changed considerably over millennia. By 770 BC, Zhongguo referred to the feudal states in the central plains, the Zhongyuan, in the Yellow River Basin, west and south of Beijing. They were effectively the central states, plural, the Zhongguo. But by the 12th century, writers in the Song period used Zhongguo to assert an identity in the face of threats from the Mongols. It was both a physical place, the old heartland, and a cultural memory. It was not, however, the name of the state. Most importantly, Zhongguo represents a political concept, the idea of a central state. I hate the translation of Zhongguo as Middle Kingdom, which makes it sound like something out of Tolkien. It might better be translated as center of the world because that is the political implications. So how did modern China level get its name? By the late 1880s, we start to see a few intellectuals complaining about the lack of a name for the country. When Huang Sunxian, I'll just dig his picture up quickly, um, who's one of the first Qing diplomats, there's Huang Sunxian in the middle. Um, he was posted to Tokyo as one of the earliest Qing diplomats. And he wrote his treatises on Japan in 1887. He began the work with a complaint Research indicates that the diverse countries of the globe, such as England or France, all boast their own state names, the only exception being Zhongguo. But China, as variously transliterated in these languages, is not a name that we've used ourselves. Recently, when addressing foreigners, we've come to use the term Zhonghua. But our neighbors have denounced us for this, pointing out that all countries on earth see themselves as situated in the center, and moreover, that treating ourselves as illustrious so Zhonghua is central illustriousness, I suppose you might translate it. So that he says that by calling ourselves illustrious and others as barbaric constitutes no more than glorifying oneself in order to demean others. So you might think that the implication of this is that Huang sees Zhongguo as being the proper name of the country. However, that's not quite true. He does want to separate the name of the country from the name of the ruling dynasty. No Da Qing Guo for him even though he was paid to represent it abroad. But in fact, he opts for a different name, Hua Xia, a name that literally translates as flourishing greatness, but also incorporates the names Hua and Sha, ancient names for peoples he considered to be the essence of his nation. Unfortunately, very few other people liked his chosen name. In 1897, Having served as a diplomat in Japan, San Francisco, London, and Singapore, Huang was appointed to be the surveillance commissioner of Hunan province. There he created a new college, the Hall of Current Affairs, and invited one of the most famous reformers of the period, Liang Tichao, to be its chief lecturer. The previous year, the two had co-founded a journal that would become very influential, the Chiang Shui Bao, the Strength Through Education Journal. Now, the following year, 1898, in the wake of the crushing of the Hundred Days reforms by Emperor Sersha, Huang rusticated himself to his home village and Liang Tichao fled to Yokohama. Uh, 
So Liang's writings in exile over the following decade made him the most influential voice among all the reformers. He, I would argue, does more than any other individual to invent China. He conjures the nation into being and sets out guidelines for how to write its history. And in his much read 1900 essay on the source of China's weakness, Liang addresses the naming issue. Liang was particularly unhappy with the traditional way of referring to the country by its ruling dynasty, the Ming Great State or the Qing Great State. This, he felt, implied there was no Chinese nation at all. It was for Liang proof of the Chinese people's cultural and intellectual immaturity. He even called it a conceptual error lodged in every person's brain. And the name that Liang chose, the, the word he used for China in the title of his essay was Zhongguo. He took the historic idea of Zhongguo as the central state with the implied meaning of center of the world in the old hierarchical cosmology and gave it a new purpose. Zhongguo would cease to represent a regional political system and become merely a name, but a name that he could argue had been used for centuries. Zhongguo, the concept, would be displaced by Zhongguo as a direct equivalent for the foreigner's word China. This process of retaining a word while utterly changing its meaning was key to the entire process of constructing or inventing modern China. There were, however, plenty of rival candidates for the new name for the country. In November 1894, in the middle of the Sino-Japanese War, a group of Chinese migrants in Hawaii held the first meeting of the Xinjiang-hui, Xing literally the Revived the Center Society. And at the meeting, they swore, they swore a revolutionary oath to, quote, expel the Tatars, revive China, and establish a unified government. And by Tatars, they were referring explicitly to the Manchu people. And the term they used for China was Zhonghua. Now, the oath that they swore was a conscious reference to one that had been sworn by Zhu Yuanjiang, the founder of the Ming dynasty centuries before. During his struggle against the Mongols in the 14th century, Zhu had also used a similar slogan, expel the Tatars and revive Zhonghua. Now, Sun Yat-sen and his fellow plotters were in effect declaring that the Qing rulers, with their roots in the Manchu-speaking Northeast, were also Tatars, outsiders who had no right to rule. The historian Peter Zaro has observed that Zhonghua, with its linguistic roots in Huaxia, has a more explicitly ethnic meaning than Zhongguo. And as Lydia Liu has commented, it appears to describe a land for the Hua people and thereby implicitly excludes the Tatars. And this would have been very appealing to the revolutionaries who saw the foreign Qing, the foreign Manchus, as the course of Zhonghua's modern troubles. Now, arguments about the best name for the country went backwards and forwards among the exiled reformers and revolutionaries throughout the 1890s and 1900s. It was finally resolved, at least as far as the revolutionaries were concerned, by Zhang Binglin, the editor of the the editor-in-chief of the revolutionary's newspaper, Min Bao. In a long essay in 1907, he disparaged the idea of calling the country Zhongguo, saying the idea of a central state was not unique to the Chinese. Instead, he argued that Hua, literally meaning efflorescence, but carrying the connotation of civilized, was the much better choice. Zhang then offered a pseudo-historical explanation for his choice. The name, he wrote, Hua, came from the place which our people first occupied, Mount Hua in Shanxi province, formed the boundary, giving our country the name Hua. Hua was originally the name of a country and not the name of a race, but today it has become a general term for both. According to the German academic Julius Schneider, Zhang preferred Hua because it referred to what he regarded as the nucleus of the new state, while also being sufficiently flexible to mean other things. As she says, it could be stretched over the territory of all the Chinese people, including those that Zhang assumed to have been assimilated, minorities in the, in the northwestern provinces, as well as parts of modern day Korea and Vietnam, places where, in Zhang's words, the Hua people tilled the soil in Han Dynasty times 2000 years earlier. Zhang then added Zhong to the name, calling it Zhonghua or Central Hua. This was, he declared, intended to distinguish between the Hua high culture and the Yi low culture. Now, a final piece of the name was added 
to satisfy the part of the revolutionary's oath about establishing a republic. So the word Mingguo was coined, literally people's state. So by the end of Zhang Binglin's article in 1907, the post-Qing, post-revolutionary country had a name, the Zhonghua Mingguo, or literally the central efflorescence people's state. And that was the name that the new state adopted when on the 1st of January 1912, Sun Yat-sen was declared to be the provisional president of the Republic of China, the Zhonghua Mingguo. And Zhonghua is still there in the name of the People's Republic too, although the word for republic has changed. That said, Liang Zhichao's choice of Zhongguo continues to be the popular name for the country. So in some ways, the reformist's legacy lives on. And I found it significant, that, very interesting, that when uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen was deposed uh, from being president of the new republic um, in February 1912, uh, the way he chose to mark the occasion was to visit the tomb of the founder of the Ming dynasty whose oath he had copied um, decades beforehand um, to pay homage with the new flag of the Republic of China on the right um, and his preferred or more preferred flag um, of the, the star flag on the left hand side. So this is just one example where the exile's view of China comes to dominate uh, the narrative of the country. And it's people like Liang Tichao and Sun Yat-sen living and writing outside the country and in contact with the modernizing Western ideas swirling around Japan, Southeast Asia, Europe and North America, who develop new ways of thinking about race, nation, history, state and territory and transplant them into the minds of their country folk through journalism and activism. But there's another layer to the story about how those intellectuals encountered those ideas in the first place. And I'll give you uh, one example. We know Liang Zhichao is the father of modern Chinese journalism and history writing. What's less well known is that for several months, he worked as the Chinese secretary for a Welsh Baptist missionary called Timothy Richard. Now Richard had worked with a group called the Society for the Promotion of Christian and General Knowledge in China for 30 or more years. And it was Richard and the Society who in 1894 translated an abridged version of a particular British history book, The 19th Century, A History by Robert Mackenzie. The translation, the Chinese language version was a sensation. 4,000 official copies were sold in the first fortnight, but more importantly, pirated copies were printed all around the country. The historian Mary Mazur has estimated that in all around a million copies of the Chinese translation were sold and that the book's influence in her words cannot be underestimated. It was read by almost the entire elite, including the emperor. Now Richard explains his reasons for choosing a translation of this book in the preface that he wrote. And he said, just as a clear mirror reveals the beautiful and the ugly, so new history reveals what flourishes and what needs to be replaced. So for Timothy Richard, new history, his term, was therefore more than a way to learn about the past. It was a guide to instruct modern people, modern nations and modern governments. So uh, eight years later, after Liang Zhichao has fled into exile in Yokohama and he's founded a new, news, a new uh, bi-weekly paper, uh, Xinmin Kongbao, he dedicates the very first edition of that magazine to the first of six installments of a major essay in which he, he explained how a new history had to be written for a new Chinese nation. The title was the new historiography, literally the new history study. And he began it by borrowing the metaphor that Timothy Richard had used in his preface to Mackenzie's book several years before. So Liang Zhichao wrote, the writing of history is the mirror reflecting the nation. It is also the source of patriotism. And he went on to dismiss the traditional 24 dynastic histories as merely a unique comprehensive account of people beheading one another. And he called for a revolution in history writing. Now he never actually got round to writing that history, but people who took inspiration from Liang did. But Liang was explicit, without the right kind of history, he argued, our nation cannot be saved. History had to belong to the people, not the rulers. As the American historian Peter Zarrow has observed, Xin Shui was a history specifically designed to promote national feeling, 
and the inspiration behind that article was clearly Timothy Richard. So there are many other examples, as I outline in the book, covering other areas of life, of history and of thought. Um, but I thought I'd just begin there uh, with a little overview of one particular line of, of argument within the book, uh, and then maybe we can broad broaden the discussion out a little further. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Bill. Um, uh, those who are not familiar with Zoom. Uh, if you wish to put questions uh, to Bill, you can do so through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen um, and we will pick those up and respond um, as, um, uh, as best we can. Uh, so uh, please do, um, do register your questions there or through the chat facility um, as well. Um, can I invite participants to ask their questions? While we're just waiting for uh, that bill, could I just ask, I mean, you started your exploration of Chinese history uh, with the China Sea. Um, what, was the, what was the route that took you from there to, to this much broader subject? Uh, I, 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 turn the book. I, th I think it began actually with uh, a couple of bottles of Newcastle Brown in the New Haven Hotel uh, with a <laughs> uh, guy, an academic uh, called Bradley Camp Davis, who's written about the history of the China-Vietnam borderlands. Um, and at one point I asked him a question and he said, uh, it depends what you mean by China. Um, and I think at that point, a kind of light bulb went on in my head and I began to realize that this, there was this category, this term that I'd never really um, um, you know, examined or, or opened before. And thinking, and it started me thinking about how, uh, if, you know, if, if China is a, is a Western, an English language term, then, you know, what, you know, obviously, People writing in Chinese don't use that term. What are the what are the meanings that are coming up? You know, are implicit in the terms that they're using, and where do those terms derive from? Um, and I suppose I'm a sort of student of someone like um, Benedict Anderson um, and um, uh, you know the idea of an imagined community and, and the idea that nations are not natural formations but are generated and, and created. Um, and so, you know, one thing led to another. And I, I think in order to try to sort of get to understand why certain people in the 1930s in China were so keen on drawing lines on maps and saying, you know, within this red line, which includes large parts of the South China Sea, uh, this territory belongs to us. Where were those ideas coming from? Um, and that then led me on this, on this journey, really. Thank you. Um, let me pick up a couple of questions um, that uh, uh, that have come in while you're talking. Um, first of all, uh, does the Communist Party fully own the name uh, of uh, China? Um, uh, how China is defined, in other words, or is there any lingering debate within China about this? And uh, a, a sort of related point um, uh, that's from Jeremy. Uh, Grant from so Scott Gibbons. Um, can you comment on whether there's a distinction between nation, as you've been discussing, and empire? Um, well, I think the, the idea of nation clearly developed in a pre-communist period. Um, and it's something that both the Republic <coughs> and the People's Republic um, shared quite strongly. Um, so in that sense, no, the Communist Party doesn't own the idea of, of nation. Um, in the book, I, I talk a little bit about um, this uh, formulation that um, you start, you've heard sort of Chinese um, uh, communist leaders use more and more, um, which um, becomes, uh, you know, translated, it, it, sounds very, it, it sounds very strange in translation because often it's the phrase 
comes out of the Chinese people and the Chinese people or the Chinese nation and the Chinese nation. But the, the idea of uh, uh, I don't know, a, 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 the communist formulation of Zhongguo Renmin, as in the, the people, the Renmin of China, Zhongguo, was quite distinct from a nationalist conception of um, uh, Zhonghua um, uh, Minzu, which was you know, the idea of a Chinese nation, a kind of more ethnic nation. Um, and for, I think until, you know, probably 20, 15, 20 years ago, they were kind of rival conceptions of the people that were, the, ret the rhetoric was used by communists on one hand and nationalists on the other hand. But now, but since then, you've started to see Communist Party leaders use both terms as a means, I think, of trying to incorporate everybody who calls himself Chinese as a way of perhaps building bridges to, to Taiwan. Um, but of course, at the same time, you have people on Taiwan who step back from using that kind of language and uh, see themselves as generating a distinction between being Taiwan, Taiwanese uh, and being Chinese. Um, so I guess to some extent the, the party has taken a step forward in trying to appropriate some of the nationalist language about the nation, particularly using this term uh, Zhonghua Minzu, um, and Minzu is an incredibly fraught uh, term to try and translate, um, mainly I think because it's trying to translate words which are pretty inchoate in English or German. I mean the, the Minzu um, comes from a Japanese translation of German ideas of the sort of late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and the whole idea about differences between ethnic group and nation and state obviously were such live issues in Europe in the early part of the 20th century. And those um, problems are brought into Chinese through Japanese translations um, in the 1900s, 10s and so on. Um, so, but yeah, so the party I think is trying to own all expressions of Chinese nationalism. Um, but that doesn't mean that it has been successful or that um, there are not other conceptions of, of, of Chinese nationalism in that sense. Um, um, yeah. follow, following up um, on that, Bill, uh, a couple of uh, related questions um, here from Charles Scanlon. What is the origin of the idea that Taiwan is an integral part of the Chinese state? And from David Taylor, how does Tibet fit into the narrative on China? Uh, well, the bit of Taiwanese history that I look at in the book is really the bit between 1895 and 1945. So, um, I mean, I don't go back into the sort of earlier period when, uh, when Taiwan becomes sort of incorporated uh, within the, the Qing domain. I note that it only formally becomes a province in 1885, um, and then 10 years later is sundered from the Qing domain uh, as part of the um, outcome of the, the Sino-Japanese War, 1894-1895. And what's remarkable to me, looking at this, is that in that 50-year period, or almost 50-year period from 1895, I'd say up until 1942, Taiwan disappears from the mental map of China. You look at maps of China, whether formally printed in uh, atlases or in school textbooks or whatever, um, and Taiwan is just not mentioned. Sometimes when there's a schematic outline of the country and it's just the, the main you know, shape of China, the island isn't even marked. Um, and other, ma and other um, uh, maps, you know, including um, maps where people are trying to um, lay claim to areas of, of, of other parts of Asia. Taiwan sits outside these lines and it's what changes is, is, is it's 1942. It's, it's only 1942 psychologically when Taiwan becomes part of China again. Um, I mean obviously it was still under Japanese occupation, doesn't become incorporated within the state until the end of the Second World War, but there is a change of thinking about Taiwan in around about 1942, and it, it's directly a result of the Second World War, um, the entry of the United States into the Pacific War, the, the prospect of Japan uh, losing, which comes into Chiang Kai-shek's mind, um, and also 
there's a little bit that the Chiang Kai-shek starts talking about um, getting Hong Kong back um, and the British basically offer him Taiwan as a sort of consolation prize um, at, um, at the Cairo conference. So, but I mean, and this is, a, this is a view of Taiwan which is shared both by nationalists and communists, it's worth saying. There are plenty of communist statements from the 1930s where they talk about the Taiwanese people as a separate group of people from China. Um, but it changes again. Um, uh, China, uh, Taiwan becomes incorporated into the nationalist narrative um, you know, from 1942 onwards, really. Um, I've, I've looked at um, Tibet uh, more in the book and more in the context of trying to get to grips with this idea of, of, of Minzu, nation or um, region, oh, sorry, no, nation or uh, ethnic group, or, or, or this is the problem, it's a, it's a slippery concept. You know, uh, famously, China has these 56 um, uh, nationality is 56 Minzu in the country, but at the same time also has only one Minzu, you know, the Chinese Minzu. So Minzu can mean both, you know, a minority group and the whole country at the same time. Um, and of course, Tibet falls into this, um, into this problem in a, in a very big way. So, um, I mean, it's clear, and you know, I, I talk about this in, also in terms of um, thinking about maps and territory, that in the 1930s, in the same period as, as tai, Taiwan has disappeared uh, from the Chinese mental map, um, that even though Taiwan, so even though Tibet uh, and Mongolia are, you know, de facto independent at this time, they are still incorporated within maps, um, the actual physical maps which are printed of the country. So there's a sense that, um, Tibet and Mongolia, and including Outer Mongolia, are part of the rightful territory of the state. Um, and I think this is, this is a kind of a place where some of the um, uh, contradictions within the reformist and the revolutionary movement you know, came out in the 1910s. So you did have among the revolutionaries a sense that they wanted to, some of them wanted, and people like Zhang Bin Lin were, were good examples, um, they wanted to have an ethnically pure Han state, whatever that meant. And if that meant shrinking to a Han core and losing Manchuria, Mongolia, Tibet and Xinjiang, that wasn't a problem because it was important that the nation and the state should be exactly the same. And if you just retreat back to the old territory of the Ming, um, it doesn't really matter about the rest. Um, Liang Chichao, from the reformist side, he wanted to maintain the uh, extent of the Qing great state. And he was very keen on incorporating uh, all of the lands of the Qing into the modern uh, reformed state, whatever it would be, and therefore had a much less um, determined, you know, sort of dogmatic view of, of nation and, and could, could tolerate difference. Um, Sun Yat-sen was at one part of him was a, was, was a Han you know, chauvinist, part of him, but also wanted to have this maximum extent of the country. And so he uh, delegates the idea of trying to, uh, you know, come up with the ideological, you know, resolving this ideological contradiction to his colleagues. He never really answers the question, but he can use the name, use the term Minzu as a way of uh, trying to kind of paper over the cracks and never really answers the question. But he talks a lot about smelting just like um, the American melting pot of identity. He just thinks that progress, modernization, and the fact that the Han in his terms are the overwhelming majority of the people of the state, that the others will just integrate and they will be smelted into a single Chinese whole. Thank you, Bill. I've got a few questions here, um, broadly around the same, um, the same issues. Um, so I'll read out three or four here um, and uh, then leave you to disentangle the threads. Um, so how conscious, asks Martin Perdrick um, from Hong Kong, how conscious are most Chinese citizens of the invention of China and how do such perceptions differ across the populations of the special administrative zones such as Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Tibet, Inner Mongolia, Macau? Um, and um, closely related to that, um, if um, 
the idea of um, China is a construct, an imagined community, uh, can it still be said to be so given the internal tensions? Can China as an internally cohesive idea survive? Uh, and, and lastly, in sort of coming at this from a, a, a sort of communist party perspective, I suppose, if you like, um, if the whole idea of modern China is heavily influenced by the West, isn't the CCP narrative schizophrenic? And how long do you see it working? Well, I, I suppose I have not enough ground level experience um, in the, those different parts of China that, that you mentioned to be able to talk convincingly about how much this is believed. But I, I guess it would vary in different places. And I guess people are capable of having different levels of um, understanding and identification that you know there are things you might say within the home or within a group of friends which might be different to the things you might say outside it um, and circumstances will change and you know there's this great word uh, ethnogenesis the idea that uh, ethnic groups can be formed and reformed in the um, you know the, the, the heat of, uh, of, of politics and the fact you know that you have people in Hong Kong, maybe you know, just a small group of people at a particular end of the political spectrum, who are talking about a Hong Kong nation um, as distinct from a Chinese nation. Well, of course, that would have made no sense at all, you know, sort of 20 years ago or before. But that sense of being separate is obviously being forged in the context of what's been going on in Hong Kong in the last decade or so, particularly the last couple of years. So, you know. There is a sense sort of a potentially, you know, of a, a Hong Kong nation being created. Um, and one, one obviously that's utter anathema to the to the Communist Party leadership. Um, but whether the you know the, the party's clearly gone to huge lengths to try to stamp out the idea of Tibetan national identity or a Uyghur national identity. Um, and are those, you know, draconian measures going to be successful in actually, uh, quotes, re-educating those populations so they, they do actually end up identifying as, as Chinese? It's clearly, it's clear that they're, you know, where, you know, the, the question is open. Um, and I talk a little bit in the book about how you had this um, tussle between the sort of the Soviet idea of nation and Chiang Kai-shek's idea of nation uh, in the 1930s. Um, and the Soviet influence was very much about uh, nations having autonomy, being able to run their own affairs, hence you have the foundation of these autonomous zones. Um, and yet Chiang Kai-shek's sympathies were, he was much more of a smelter. He wanted to see all these, disappear, all these um, differences um, disappear and that there should be a single unitary state with a single Chinese identity and what we've ended up with is a kind of you know as a mishmash and you can see this you know in the in the in the family of, of Xi Jinping himself you know his father was somebody who had good relations uh, with the then Panchen Lama um, and it was very much in favor of minorities being allowed to manage themselves uh, and yet Xi Jinping the son is the one who is overseeing this uh, forced integration and the internment camps and all the rest of it that we've seen in Xinjiang. I'm not sure if I've answered all the questions there, but what, have I left anything out? Um, I, I, there's sort of endless scope, I think, in, in that, that question. Um, and I like to move, it's a related point, but it's coming at this from a, a different angle. Um, um, uh, could you tell us, <coughs> um, how modern cartography might have influenced China's present day borders. Um, the questioner notes the sultanates and kingdoms of Southeast Asia didn't have clearly defined territories until Europeans introduced the notion of surveyed borders. Um, did something similar happen with China? Um, yes, and I, 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 there's an interesting little vignette I, I talk about in the book, which is, um, the, the, news, the Republican peer newspaper called Shunmao um, in 1934, I think it was, um, decided it was going to 
commemorate its 60th anniversary of publication by having an expedition to the country's frontiers. Um, and but they had a meeting where they called in some geographers to come and advise them. And they concluded that they didn't know where the country's frontiers actually were. Um, and this resulted in Shunbao publishing uh, an atlas, uh, the first real sort of post-revolutionary new atlas of the country. And the preface to this atlas, uh, the atlas is in the School of Oriental and African Studies, um, has this little sort of uh, vignette printed in the preface about the fact that this atlas is the result of the country's experts not being entirely sure about where the um, country's frontiers lay. Um, so the idea of having to draw definitive boundaries um, clearly did have an influence on the way that people thought about territory. They had to think about justifications for why a boundary should be in one place and not another. Um, and you, you often see um, appeals to a kind of a natural boundary, you know, a range of mountains or a river or you know, the sea, obviously. Um, but it's, of course, you know, there's some big groups of mountains which lie well within China's borders, which are not seen as natural frontiers. Uh, and whereas there are others which are slightly further out, which are seen as natural frontiers. So, so there's nothing particularly natural about a, you know, any particular range of mountains being a natural frontier. You can kind of, frontier can move depending on um, you know, which ones, which mountains you think are more important. Um, uh, I mean, there, are, you know, there were places where the Qing state had been forced to delineate borders, you know, by the British uh, in, you know, on the Burma frontier, or in after conflict with the French on the Indochina frontier. Um, and of course, the, the, the Russian boundaries uh, to the north as well. Um, so the that was starting to happen, but it, it, you know, it, the, the borders remained unfixed well into the 1930s and, and even the 1940s. And of course, you know, um, and it's only been you know, in the last 10 years or so that you know, the actual final demarcations of borders with Southeast Asia, even with you know, a border with, with Russia, have been actually sort of you know, placed in the ground. And of course, you've still got arguments you know, with India. So yes, I think the you know, modern map making did um, force, uh, oblige the new state to um, try to regularize its boundaries. Um, but there was, um, you know, because it was done in a very politicized and fraught context in the 1930s, obviously with the Japanese attacks and that sort of thing, and in the, you know, within a scene within a struggle with Western European imperialism, then. Um, a lot of the kind of um, these these arguments were invested with a lot of emotion um, and, um, uh, and and politics, um, which has tended to, I think, obscure a lot of the rather fragile foundations for some of that cartography. Yeah. And I have a chapter in the book when I talk about how these ideas of the naturalness of the territory are inculcated through um, school books um, and um, uh, newspapers and maps in public places and that sort of thing, which is based a lot on the work of um, uh, Robert Culp and, um, and Peter Zara. Well, thank you. Um, James Kraska has asked, could you relate how this affects our approach to China now? That's a pretty big question. But. Yes, yes. I think what I wanted to show was um, that a lot of these ideas that uh, we commonly approach China with um, are, well, the way we view China, are not themselves particularly ancient. Um, and that they are, they were forged, you know, around about a century ago. Um, and that we should therefore see them as political constructs. And I think we're used to the idea of understanding that Britain itself um, would, um, uh, you know, was, a, you know was, was constructed uh, through a you know, period of political turbulence, you know, Germany, Turkey, France. We're used to these ideas, but somehow China is approached differently as if 
you know, it is and always has been this, you know, this 5,000 year old civilization, which has been unchanging and other. So in this sense, a lot of these narratives, which I, I, I talk about being constructed in this period have been incredibly successful because they continue to affect the way that foreigners talk about China um, to this day. Um, and so I wanted to kind of show how they were also created for political reasons and in the context of a revolutionary, pre-revolutionary pre period. Um, and, um, and therefore, you know, we don't need to take these things as somehow sacred, that we can, it is possible to interrogate them in a, in a rational way um, without um, you know, being uh, anti-Chinese, without being, um, you know, condescending or you know, imperialist minded or whatever, but actually to look at what, you know, uh, what actually happened back then and see whether it's still relevant now. Um, and of course, you know, when I think, you know, the South China Sea, you know, I look at it as, you know, there's nothing sacred about anybody's territorial claim there. Um, and I guess you can, you know, start to look at the way that, um, I don't know, to take a completely different example, I, I, took, I have a chapter about language and the idea of, you know, when the idea of a single national language, you know, uh, where that comes from, where it's going. And of course, that has a direct, you know, impact on the people of Hong Kong, because a lot of their feelings of separateness are generated from feelings of uh, linguistic difference and so forth. And so, you know, what does it, you know, what does it mean for people to be able to speak uh, a, a different you know, language or topolect is the, is the word that, that, that I use. Um, and so there are reasonable discussions to be had about the history here, which I think get beneath the, the clash just simply between, um, uh, you know, a, a state and its survival and the rights of people to be different. Thank you very much. I mean, there's um, <clears throat> a question here from Richard Seabam, which you've touched on there just uh, a moment ago. The question is, are linguistic variations being attacked by the PRC? Um, well, clearly, yes. I mean, clearly the whole purpose of, of Putonghua uh, common speech as a, um, you know, as a political agenda um, is, uh, is exactly that, is to sort of smelt out the differences and to uh, get everybody literally speaking the same language. Um, but the fact that they are still having to announce these campaigns decades after they were initially introduced, and there are still hundreds of millions of people who don't speak the national language um, in China, um, shows how, how difficult it is. Um, the, I mean, that, I think that there's a kind of, there's a conception of Chinese language that somehow there was an original root of Chinese, and then it kind of diversified into different streams, you know, into, into Shanghainese or Cantonese or, or Hokkien or whatever. But increasingly, the new research is showing us that there are connections between different genetic markers among different spe when speakers of different languages. I mean, this is pretty kind of new research. So, you know, it may, it may turn out to, to be wrong. But it seems to suggest to me that actually the people who live in these places came from different parts. You know, maybe some, you know, a lot of the people of coastal peoples probably migrated around coastal areas through Southeast Asia before settling along the coast of what's now China. And they came from different sources from the people who came overland through Central or Inner Asia. And so it's not surprising that they're going to have different ways of speaking because they are, you know, they are different ethnic groups. And they have different languages, different topolets, if you want to call them that. Um, and so, what China, you know, what a, a central state that comes in and says, well, we're all going to speak Chinese and this is how you're doing it, you're not harmonizing, but you are uh, steamrolling over, over local difference. Um, and, you know, that historically has caused problems everywhere in the world. I mean, even, you know, in the UK, you know, the idea of, you know, I mean, of English steaming over Welsh and Gaelic languages has been a long standing source of bitterness. Um, and so it's not, I don't find it surprising that you get similar issues emerging, particularly in Hong Kong, 
but you know you also get you're also getting a kind of localism in in Shanghai for example about to do with language as well and, and potentially other places as well thank you bill um uh, one or two uh, people have asked sort of related questions um which collectively are about the sort of reaction to your book that you expect in china and i, I think the questioners are not so much thinking about how many copies you might sell as <laughs> how um how the authorities um and indeed the the public narrative about china might uh, respond to uh, this kind of articulation? Yeah, I don't think I'm expecting a publication license at all. Um, I mean, I, well, I, I think it'll be very interesting in, in Taiwan. I think, I think a lot of people in Taiwan will quite enjoy it. Uh, I think possibly in Hong Kong too, as long as I've got, got my facts right. Um, but, it, you know, elsewhere, um, uh, I, I think there'll be a lot of resistance, frankly. I mean, I think these things are kind of, uh, uh, sacred ideas, um, and they're you know drummed into each generation as as they as they pass through school, um, and the constant invocation of the Chinese people and you know the Chinese nation um, is is based upon it, and it's a key foundation of of, of party rule. Um, I mean, it's, my point is not to say that you know there is no such thing as Chinese identity. Um, my point is to uh, show that this kind of totalizing idea um, is a new one um, and that the desire for uh, you know, utter harmonization, I suppose, um, is, is, also, is also new. Um, but there is a you know, there is divergence and there is difference. Um, I mean, I, I kind of have a go at this idea of Chinese history um, as being this sort of, you know, 5,000 years of, of civilization. Um, I mean, if you look at, you know, the last uh, 2,000 years of you know, Chinese history, at least 1,000 years of them, China has been ruled by people from Inner Asia. So why is it that we see continuity? Why do we see dynasty um, Chinese rule as being the norm, and then we talk about these kind of periods in between as just somehow an aberration, when in fact, you know, the Qing were Inner Asians, the Jurchen were Inner Asians, the Mongols, you know, the, you know, all these people, they were not Chinese, yet they end up ruling this area of East Asia, um, and they get folded into a, to a Chinese history. So what I want to do is sort of open up and say, you know, Let's, let's talk about East Asian history. Um, let's see it as diverse. Let's not try and kind of backdate China into the past in a place you know, where, where it doesn't belong. Yes, you know, there was a culture that uh, wrote in characters. Yes, there was the idea of the central state you know, in, in, these, in these places uh, and these ideas. Um, yes, there was an urban culture which had, you know, diet and, and aspects of culture, but the idea that there was a nation or that there was a single state uh, going all the way back into this, into this long period, uh, that's very much a modern invention. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to end um, in a moment, but there's uh, one question uh, that I would still like to pick up. Um, from Harry Nichols, and it goes to the broadest aspect of what you've been talking about, Bill. Um, Harry asks, is there a state that is not an invention? <laughs> uh, I guess I'd probably have to say no, but unless you can sort of think, <laughs> um, I mean, states are clearly invented because they are, you know, political groupings. Um, Nations, I would say, you know, following Benedict Anderson people, are also uh, inventions. I mean, we had a kind of bloody century in Europe, you know, 1848 to 1945, where nations and states tried to become the same thing, and we ended up with a century of genocide and war. Um, so the idea that you can actually you can draw these hard lines around nations and states and include everybody that wants to be included and exclude everybody else um, and European history has shown that to be um, uh, you know 
pulse. Um, and China is trying to do things in a different way. Um, but if the end result is putting a million people into internment camps to get them to try and think differently, um, then you can see some of the parallels, you know, with European uh, history as, as well. So um, there is, you know, we're, I think, yes, all states, all nations are constructed, but I don't think we've, well, as I say, these, these academics have, you know, opened my eyes and hopefully everybody else's eyes to this, but I'm hoping that through this book, we can have a kind of maybe a broader discussion about these topics too. Well, thank you very much indeed, Bill. Um, and I'm going to have to draw the meeting to a close there. Uh, I'd like to thank you um, especially, but everyone who has joined us today. I think it's been a fascinating discussion and one that clearly has a long way to go. Issues of national identity uh, are sort of persistent and sometimes troublesome. Uh, the UK is having some of its own of that kind at the moment. Um, uh, the talk has been recorded and uh, in the next couple of days, the recording will be uh, available on the Society's YouTube channel. Um, so please look out for that. And uh, we will be sending out a notification soon about our next event. Thank you very much indeed.